Y'all still don't think these scientists be doing some shady stuff? Here's 20 freaky scientists who experimented on themselves. Check this out. Throughout history, the quest for scientific understanding has sometimes led researchers to become their own test subjects, their own guinea pigs. Although it's not exactly ethical, these often led to breakthroughs. From a man who ate a spoonful of petroleum jelly to vouch for his invention, to a man who had serious business with coffee, here are 20 freaky scientists who experimented on themselves. Number 20. The most slippery man alive. Petroleum jelly. There's a chance this is one of the staple items in your household. Because of its name, used to a be. lot of people refused to use it when it was first released. And although there are still people who refuse to use this product, which I respect, its creator did a great job of showcasing how useful and harmless it is. Robert Chesabrew is the name behind this invention. It all started with his intrigue with a residue called rod wax found on oil rig pumps. This allegedly had healing properties and was often used to cure the cuts and burns of the workers. Moving to the lab, Chesabrew refined the rod wax into a lighter gel-like substance, which we now know as petroleum jelly. It was an effective product, and he knew it, but to convince the common folk, he needed to use drastic measures. He embarked on a rigorous self-experimentation campaign. Yes, you heard that right. He inflicted various cuts and burns on himself, demonstrating petroleum jelly's healing properties. But that's not all. He ate a spoonful of the jelly every day to demonstrate its safety. This shows just how much he trusted petroleum jelly. Yeah. You can say that all his sacrifice was worth it because today, this product is among the most versatile things you can buy at the supermarket. Before we go on, like this video, smash. I've never known it to have healing properties, though. Yeah, I might be putting me on to something. The subscribe button and click the notification bell right now. Number 19. Newton's Eye Experimentation. Imagine being so dedicated to understanding light and vision that you're willing to experiment on your own eye. That's Isaac Newton, all right. We know him mainly for his laws about gravity and motion. But did you know he also dedicated his life to understanding light's behavior in human sight? Newton's curiosity about light's behavior led him to a rather extreme form of self-experimentation. Due to his investigations into optics, Newton became fascinated with understanding color and light perception. To delve deeper, he conducted an experiment where he inserted a blunt bodkin, a type of small flat needle, between his eye and the bone, gently pressing on his eyeball. Yes, he did that to himself. This risky move wasn't out of recklessness, but a profound desire to learn firsthand how light and pressure affected vision. Through this experiment, Newton observed the phosphenes, the rings of color that appear when pressure is applied to the eye. It sounds alarming today, but back then, it was a groundbreaking approach to understand human vision. Moreover, this self-experiment, as cringeworthy as it may seem, contributed significantly to the field of optics. It was part of his larger work that eventually led to the development of color theory. Number 18. The man who injected polio into his family. Between 1948 now, and 1955, several polio epidemics occurred. It was a tough time. Without a vaccine, many were affected. And so, Jonas Salk stepped up, but not without making some sacrifices. Your After family? developing what he believed to be a safe and effective vaccine, Salk faced a significant hurdle proving its safety. Now we all know just how horrifying it is to accept medication without confirming its safety, and Salk knew that. And so, he and his family became the first to receive the vaccine. That's right, Salk inoculated himself, his wife, and their children, demonstrating his trust in his creation. His actions were pivotal in garnering public trust and facilitating one of the most significant- His actions were pivotal? How about they were a crime? He committed a crime. I don't know how things were back then, but you can't do no mess like that today. Clinical trials of all time. This trial demonstrated the vaccine's safety, leading to its widespread use and ultimately turning the tide against polio. Number 17. Curie and her radioactive experiments. Back in Poland in 1867, Marie Curie moved to Paris to further her education. There, she delved into physics and chemistry setting the stage for revolutionary discoveries. Curie's significant contribution to science was her pioneering research on radioactivity. In fact, she coined the term herself. Along with her husband, Pierre Curie, she discovered two new elements, polonium and radium. 
These discoveries not only earned her two Nobel Prizes in physics and chemistry, but also opened new avenues in the understanding of atomic structure and radiation. But Curie's research came with a cost. At that time, the harmful effects of radiation exposure were poorly understood. Curie often carried test tubes containing radioactive isotopes in her pocket and stored them in her desk drawer, marveling at their faint blue glow. This constant exposure, both in her laboratory and in field hospitals during World War I, where she developed mobile X-ray units, contributed to her developing aplastic anemia, a condition linked to high levels of radiation exposure. Marie Curie's passing in 1934 was a direct consequence of her prolonged exposure to radiation. It's a reminder of the sacrifices made by scientists in the pursuit of knowledge. This goes to show just how much they deserve to be remembered, even decades after their deaths. Number 16. The Laughing Gas As kids, we were taught not to inhale or taste any chemicals in the laboratory. But Humphrey Davy, a renowned chemist, did precisely that in the name of science. Born in the late 18th century, Davy's fascination with the world of chemistry led him to conduct self-experiments with a substance known as nitrous oxide, or laughing gas. Joseph Priestley first synthesized nitrous oxide, but it was Davy who studied its properties extensively. Working at the Pneumatic Institution in Bristol, Davy was intrigued by the gas's effects and potential uses. His experiments were both methodical and by today's standards, quite risky. Davy began by inhaling small quantities of the gas to observe its effects on his body and mind. These self-administered experiments were quite revolutionary. He noted that nitrous oxide induced a state of euphoria, laughter, and sometimes visual hallucinations, leading to its nickname, laughing gas. But Davy didn't stop at casual observation. He meticulously recorded his physiological responses, including increased heart rate and a sense of exhilaration. Then. Davy began exploring its potential as a pain reliever. He subjected himself to physical pain, like a toothache, to test the gas's effectiveness in alleviating discomfort. This line of inquiry led to the gas's later use as an anesthetic. As time passed, his experiments included his friends and colleagues, who also inhaled nitrous oxide. These group experiments were often social events, yet they held significant scientific value. Davy's observations on the effects of nitrous oxide in different individuals provided insights into its varying impacts and potential medical applications. Number 15. AIDS Vaccine If you love reading medical journals, perhaps you've come across Pradeep Seth. After all, he's one of the contemporary researchers in this video. Pradeep Seth is an Indian virologist who is keen on finding an AIDS vaccine. He first researched it when it was surrounded by stigma, uncertainty, and fear. Decades ago, people didn't understand the sickness. Many believed that being in the same room as a person with AIDS or HIV would heighten their chances of being infected. Although that wasn't the case, it took a long time for the stigma surrounding them to lessen. And so, in an attempt to prove the efficacy of a potential HIV vaccine he was developing, Seth took the unusual step of testing it on himself. Although Seth wasn't endangering anyone but himself, and despite his assurances that he trusted the vaccine, his peers and colleagues denounced the trial as unethical. Number 14. Very unethical. Stubbins Firth. What the? How far would someone go in the name of science? If you ask Stubbins Firth, he would do something most of us couldn't stomach. In the 17th century, yellow fever emerged as a significant health threat in tropical regions, especially Africa and the Americas. Its symptoms, including fever, chills, and jaundice, earned it the name Yellow Fever. The severe outbreaks it caused made it a problem for many nations. It persisted for centuries because, well, we had no way of understanding it at the time. Fast forward to the 19th century, and American doctor Stubbins Firth, who was only a medical student at the time, commenced studies at the University of Pennsylvania to further understand the communicability and causes of Yellow Fever. At that time, the cause of Yellow Fever was a mystery and theories about its transmission were numerous and often incorrect. For instance, the fact that bad air or miasma was causing yellow fever. Contrary to the prevailing belief of his time, Firth argued that yellow fever was not contagious. And so, to prove a point, he exposed himself to various materials from yellow fever patients, including their blood and even black vomit, a notorious symptom of the disease. Firth's most extreme experiment involved him drinking the black vomit of patients to demonstrate oh, that the disease could not the... be transmitted through these fluids. 
He began injecting black vomit into his veins, under his cuticles, and into his eye, but he remained healthy. And although he never got to figure out the cause of yellow fever, spoiler alert, it's caused by mosquitoes, he eliminated the belief that it was transmitted through human fluids. Number 13. Oh my God. The man who deliberately infected himself with a disease. Born in Scotland in 1728, Hunter is often hailed as the father of modern surgery. I know a lot of y'all find this so noble that they would do this for mankind, but I'm looking at it in a sense of it's got to be. A, there's always another way. There's always an alternative than you using yourself or your family or just random people. Like, no, man, like there's there's another way. Got to be. His contributions to medicine are vast but it's his unconventional methods and fearless self-experimentation that truly set him apart. Hunter's interest in anatomy and surgery began early in his career, leading him to become one of the most skilled surgeons of his time. He was not just a practitioner, he was a fervent advocate for experimental research in medicine. Hunter believed in learning through direct observation and hands-on experience, a philosophy that guided much of his work. One of Hunter's most notable self-experiments involved inoculating himself with material from a patient with gonorrhea. He aimed to understand the relationship between gonorrhea and syphilis, two diseases that were often confused at the time. This experiment, however, resulted in Hunter contracting syphilis, not gonorrhea, leading to a painful and chronic condition. Despite this setback, Hunter continued his research, driven by a relentless pursuit of medical knowledge. And yes, despite contracting the disease, his marriage wasn't completely halted, but rather just delayed. That's one brave woman right there. Number 12. A Pioneer Who Sacrificed Himself Born in 1859, Elizabeth Fleischmann Ashim was an American X-ray pioneer. She entered the field in 1895 when Wilhelm Conrad Röntgen had just discovered X-rays. At a time when this technology was in its infancy, and its potential and risks were not fully understood. She opened one of the first X-ray laboratories in San Francisco. Her work was groundbreaking, aiding physicians in diagnosing injuries and illnesses that were previously challenging to detect. Driven by a passion for her work and a desire to aid in medical diagnostics, Fleischmann Ashim often used herself as a subject in X-ray experiments. She believed in the importance of her work, and like many of her contemporaries, was unaware of the dangers posed by prolonged exposure to X-rays. Her dedication to advancing radiographic techniques led her to test equipment and procedures on herself frequently. Unfortunately, Fleischmann Ashim's continuous exposure to radiation took a severe toll on her health. She developed radiation-induced injuries, a direct result of her frequent and unprotected exposure to X-rays. These injuries eventually led to her untimely death at the age of 43. However, her achievements were remembered years after her death. Number 11. Lazaro Spallanzani and his experiments with digestion. Lazaro Spallanzani, an 18th century Italian biologist, was a trailblazer studying natural sciences. His work significantly advanced our understanding of biological processes, particularly physiology and reproduction. One of the most intriguing aspects of Spallanzani's work was his approach to experimentation, often using himself as a test subject to validate his findings. A key area of Spallanzani's research was digestion. In a bold move to understand this process better, he conducted experiments on himself. He swallowed small linen bags containing various substances, then later retrieved them to examine the effects of digestion. This direct approach allowed Spallanzani to observe firsthand how different materials were broken down in the stomach, providing valuable data that challenged existing theories. Despite the lack of advanced technology in his era, Spallanzani's research was marked by a meticulous approach. He meticulously recorded his observations and consistently sought to verify his hypotheses through practical experiments. And what did he find out? Well, he helped us understand more about digestion, and he did it at a time when scientific tools were limited, far more limited than today. Number 10. You know who he made happy with his results? Drug dealers. Why? Because now they can use drug mules. And they can have them swallow stuff and let it out later with no effects. That's who was happy about this, this result. Scientist who put a needle through his heart. In the late 1920s, cardiology was in its infancy, and the direct examination of a living heart was considered impossible. However, Werner Frostman knew that humans could achieve this. 
He theorized that a catheter could be inserted directly into the heart for diagnostic purposes. To prove this, he conducted an experiment that was as risky as it was revolutionary. But of course, no one would ever want to be experimented upon with the possibility of having their hearts poked and prodded. And so, Werner Frostman did it himself. Frostman inserted a urinary catheter into a vein in his own arm. Then, in an unprecedented move, he advanced it into his heart. This procedure, which he performed without any guidance or modern imaging technology, demonstrated that it was possible to access the heart safely through the body's vascular system. It was the first step towards developing cardiac catheterization, a technique now routinely used to diagnose and treat heart conditions. This procedure allows doctors to measure heart function, identify blockages, and even perform life-saving interventions like angioplasty. Despite the significance of his work, Frostman faced skepticism and criticism from his peers. At the time, his methods were seen as reckless. It was only decades later that the full value of his contribution was recognized, culminating in him receiving the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 1956. Number 9. Experimentation in Sensory Physiology Sir Henry Head was an English neurologist whose work significantly advanced our understanding of the nervous system. At the heart of Head's research was a burning question. How does the human body perceive sensations through nerves? Well, to know the answer, Dr. James Sharon performed surgery on Head's radial nerve, one of the primary nerves in the arm. The purpose was to study the regrowth of nerves and the return of sensation following the nerve's deliberate injury. This self-experimentation was not only a display of incredible personal courage, but also a meticulous scientific inquiry. Over several years, Head carefully documented the changing sensations in his arm as the nerve regenerated. He cataloged various sensory experiences, distinguishing between protopathic and epicritic sensations, terms he coined to describe different aspects of touch and temperature perception. Proto Head's what? findings were groundbreaking. His work shed light on how different types of sensory nerves contribute to our perception of touch and temperature. It was a major step forward in neurology, providing insight into nerve function and sensory disorders. Number 8. Stark in Nutritional Science oh. William Stark was a British physician in the 18th century who did a series of self-experiments that had good and bad effects on the field of nutritional science. Stark's experiments, conducted in the 1760s, were driven by his curiosity to understand the effects of different diets on the human body. In a groundbreaking experiment, Stark limited himself to a monotonous diet for each trial consuming only one type of food for an extended period. He meticulously documented his physical condition, mood, and weight throughout the experiments. His diet included bread and water, honey, roasted goose, and even a regimen of only sugar. Stark aimed to observe the changes and effects of these singular diets on his health. As Stark progressed with his trials, he began experiencing various health issues, including fatigue, digestive problems, and weight loss. Despite these alarming symptoms, he continued his experiments with unwavering dedication. Stark's determination to document the effects of dietary restrictions on his own body reflected the spirit of inquiry and experimentation prevalent in the scientific community of his time. Tragically, Stark's self-experimentation led to his early death at the age of 29. Jeez. His detailed records, published posthumously, provided valuable insights into the importance of a varied and balanced diet. Number 7. Hmm scientist who deliberately contracted an ulcer. In the early 1980s, the prevailing view was that ulcers were primarily caused by stress, spicy foods, and too much acid in the stomach. However, Australian physician Barry Marshall proposed a radical new theory that many ulcers were caused by a bacterium called Helicobacter pylori. To prove his hypothesis, Marshall experimented on himself in 1984. He ingested a broth containing Helicobacter pylori expecting to develop, perhaps after years, an ulcer or signs of gastritis. Surprisingly, he fell ill much quicker, within just a few days, exhibiting symptoms of acute gastritis, inflammation of the stomach lining. This rapid onset of symptoms provided strong direct evidence supporting his theory. Marshall's self-experiment was a turning point in the understanding of peptic ulcers. It demonstrated that bacteria, not stress or diet were a primary cause of ulcers in the stomach and duodenum. This discovery led to a paradigm shift in how these conditions were treated. 
moving away from acid-reducing medications alone to include antibiotics to eradicate the Helicobacter pylori infection. Marshall's approach, although effective, was unconventional and risky. It raised ethical Fair questions risk. about self-experimentation and medical research. Nevertheless, the impact of his work was profound and widely recognized. In 2005, Barry Marshall and his colleague Robin Warren were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine for discovering the bacterium Helicobacter pylori and its role in gastritis and peptic ulcer disease. Number 6. The Surgeon Who Operated on Himself now, this is crazy. Evan O'Neill Kane, a surgeon from Pennsylvania, made medical history through an extraordinary act of self-surgery. In 1921, at the age of 60, Kane carried out an appendectomy on himself, demonstrating a remarkable level of skill and audacity. This feat wasn't a mere stunt to flex his skills. It had a purpose. Kane aimed to prove that local anesthesia was a viable alternative to general anesthesia for certain minor operations. Kane had long been an advocate for the use of local anesthesia, arguing that it was safer for patients, particularly those who were elderly or in poor health. General anesthesia, which renders the patient unconscious, carries more risks, especially for individuals with heart or lung conditions. By operating on himself under local anesthesia, Kane sought to show firsthand that patients could endure minor surgeries without the risks associated with general anesthesia. On the day of the surgery, Kane made a small incision in his lower abdomen and successfully removed his appendix while maintaining full consciousness. He administered a local anesthetic to Man, most people would have passed out, bro. Seeing the blood, all of that, poking yourself. I don't care what type of anesthesia you are. Some people can't handle that type of, just see the mere sight of blood takes them out. The area, but remained fully alert throughout the procedure. Kane's self-operation attracted significant attention from the medical community and the public. It did. Number five, the man who injected himself with hookworm. David Pritchard, in an unorthodox experiment, injected himself with hookworm larvae to study the effects of parasitic infections on the human no immune system. This bold step was a part of his research into the hygiene hypothesis, suggesting that the rise in allergies and autoimmune diseases in developed countries might be linked to our overly sanitized environments. Pritchard's fascination with this hypothesis was driven by observations that certain parasitic infections could mitigate symptoms of autoimmune disorders like allergies and asthma. The reasoning behind this theory is intriguing. It suggests that a lack of exposure to infectious agents in our cleaner, modern lifestyle may cause the immune system to overreact, leading to an increase in allergic and autoimmune responses. Motivated to explore this further, Pritchard took the extreme measure of becoming his own test subject by introducing hookworm lock- So if we're not exposed to a lot of different things, that's bad. And basically, is it going to make us sicker or worse? Or is that what he's implying? I don't know. I've heard that before. But at the same time, I, I don't know, man. Because I know your body builds up antibodies and does different things like that to protect you against the stuff that you come in contact with on a daily. But who's to say in the long run that helps? I, I don't know. Are they into his body? He aimed to closely observe the interaction between the parasites and his immune system. Typically, hookworms are considered harmful and known for causing anemia and malnutrition. However, yeah. Pitchard's controlled self-infection was a calculated risk for observation. The results of his self-experimentation were quite revealing. Pritchard noted changes in his body's immune response following the hookworm infection, supporting the idea that exposure to certain parasites might help regulate the immune system. This could potentially open new avenues for treating various autoimmune conditions. Through his work, David Pritchard has shed light on the complex interactions between humans and parasites. His findings contribute to a growing body of research that explores how controlled parasitic infections could be harnessed to treat autoimmune diseases, changing our traditional understanding of parasites in human health. Number 4. The Father of Sleep Research In the 1930s, Nathaniel Kleitman, together with his student Bruce Richardson, decided to delve deep into the uncharted territory of circadian rhythms by spending an extended period in the complete isolation of Kentucky's Mammoth Cave. Their goal? To determine if the human body has an intrinsic sleep-wake cycle independent of external cues like sunlight. This question was pivotal in the realm of sleep research. 
To explore it, Kleitman and Richardson lived in the cave for a month, cut off from any natural light and external time indicators. They adopted a 28-hour day, a deviation from the regular 24-hour cycle to see how their bodies and sleep patterns would react. This setup was no small feat. Imagine adjusting your entire sleep schedule and daily routine to a rhythm that doesn't align with the natural day-night cycle. Kleitman and Richardson alternated between 9 hours of sleep and 19 hours of wakefulness while meticulously recording their observations. Changes in sleep patterns, body temperature, and overall alertness. What they found was fascinating and a bit unexpected. Adapting to this 28-hour cycle proved challenging, suggesting that the human body is naturally tuned to the 24-hour rhythm of the Earth's rotation. This insight was groundbreaking. It provided concrete evidence of an internal biological clock or a circadian rhythm influencing our daily sleep patterns and physiological processes. Number 3. Mm. The woman who let a sand flea live in her foot. Sand fleas, or tunga penetrans, are tiny insects known for burrowing into the skin of their hosts, often leading to painful and potentially harmful infections. Typically found in tropical areas, these parasites can cause tungiasis, a condition characterized by inflammation, itching, and even secondary infections. And so, a woman named Marlene Thielica decided to use herself as her own research experiment. She deliberately allowed a sand flea to embed itself in her foot. She aimed to better understand tungiasis, a largely understudied condition often affecting impoverished communities. By observing the parasite's development within her own body, she hoped to gather valuable insights that could aid in better treatment and prevention strategies. She also sought to answer another question. Does the sand flea reproduce on the dusty ground, its initial habitat, or does it do so while comfortably nestled inside its host, like a human foot, where it can extract the necessary blood to nourish its eggs? She observed that the flea appeared to develop normally, but she soon noticed an anomaly. It wasn't laying eggs, something uncommon for an embedded and seemingly mature flea. Moreover, it defied expectations by living much longer than typical fleas. After two months, it was still releasing fluid from its abdomen, indicating its continued survival, but no signs of eggs. This affected area became uncomfortable, causing itching and pain, disrupting her normal walking. Feeling uneasy about leaving it in for an extended period, she decided to remove it. The conclusion suggests that sand fleas likely undergo the mating process inside their hosts, although fortunately this occurrence did not happen to Thelica. Although she found out less than expected, She's still commended as a great scientist for sacrificing her comfort and safety for knowledge. Number oh. 2. Knuckle Cracking David Unger conducted a unique and long-term self-experiment to address a common question. Does cracking your knuckles lead to arthritis? For decades, I thought this was an urban legend. Like, my parents, grandparents, they used to tell me this all the time, but I thought this was just an old wives' tale. You know, something like that, maybe. Many have pondered whether this habitual act, often accompanied by a popping sound, has any long-term effects on the joints. Unger set out to find an answer in a rather unconventional way. For 50 years, Unger consistently cracked the knuckles of his left hand while leaving the knuckles of his right hand uncracked. This half-century-long experiment was his way of creating a controlled study on himself. By only cracking the knuckles on one hand, he could directly compare the long-term effects on both hands. Finally, after 50 years, Unger examined the results of his self-experiment. Remarkably, he found no significant difference in the development of arthritis between his two hands. His experiment suggested that cracking knuckles did not increase the risk of developing exactly. arthritis in the joints of his hands. See? And now it's time for today's topic. Now here's a freaky scientist who dared to experiment on herself. Remember the guy who did a self-surgery? Well, it seems that this scientist went down the wrong path and ended up with irreparable damage on their nose. face. Yikes. Number 1. Gustav III of Sweden This isn't quite a self-experiment, but it's still among the most unbelievable experiments in history. Gustav III, who reigned in the 18th century, is often associated with an infamous coffee experiment designed to prove the dangers of coffee, which at the time was considered by many to be a harmful beverage. Concerned by the growing popularity of coffee and influenced by the prevailing beliefs of its supposed adverse health effects, Gustav III sought to demonstrate its dangers scientifically. 
He orchestrated an experiment using two condemned prisoners. One was ordered to drink large amounts of coffee daily, while the other consumed a similar amount of tea. Physicians oversaw the experiment to monitor the effects on the prisoner's health. The outcome of this experiment, however, turned out to be quite the opposite of what Gustav III had anticipated. According to the stories, the tea drinker passed away first. In contrast, the coffee drinker lived for many years, even outliving the physicians who conducted the experiment and Gustav III himself, who was assassinated in 1792.